professor actually sat me down and said, you do realize that if you get a sport management degree, you're going to be working a hundred hour weeks starting out potentially for free. And I said, no, I thought I was going to be in the draft room for the Cincinnati Reds and I was going to be picking all the prospects. He said, it's not how it works. This episode of k and was brought to you by Pandio. More on them in a little. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing my friend, Brennan Ruby. Brennan has eight years of experience as an analyst in the finance and talent acquisition spaces. Most of his time is spent building SQL queries or visualizing data inside of Power BI. Brennan's love for sports collides with his passion for data on Instagram at Cardboard Calculus and on rotogrinders.com. I'll link his work below. When not crunching numbers, he's chasing around his 16-month-old son Grayson or spending time with his wife Brittany. In this interview, we learn about the incredible things Brennan's doing with analytics in the trading card space. We also touch on NFTs, time management. Finally, you learn about how he got paid to write about his sports analytics passion on rotogrinders.com. I hope you enjoy the show. Brennan, thank you so much for coming on the KNN podcast here. We've had quite uh, quite a few interactions in the past. We did some stuff with playing numbers and, and creating some some pretty cool sports content. But I wanted to bring you on to talk about one, your experience as a data analyst, and two, your pretty cool, I guess it's like a personal project to turn a little bit more than that of analyzing uh, sports trading card pricing and, and that whole market. So thank you again for coming on. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I'm a, a huge fan of your work and, and I'm really glad to, to be here and to, to chat it up with you. Well, I'm, I'm also a fan of your work and uh, that's why you're here as well. So, um, you know, before we really jump into the specifics of what you're working on in the trading card space, I'd love to hear your kind of origin story, how you got interested in data analytics to begin with. And, you know, what, what has your career been like from education to working to doing stuff outside of work? Yeah, absolutely. So my love for data started when I was around 12 or 13 years old. So I, I had grown up playing sports my entire life. Um, however, I was never, I would never say that I was top of class or, or one of the elite athletes that I was around. And so I, I quickly realized that um, I wasn't gonna be able to be a part of sports as a participant for very long, um, certainly much past high school. And at around that same time, my dad um, kind of let me join his fantasy football league with his buddies. They needed an extra one. Uh, an extra player. And so I got into it. And of course, me uh, being very competitive, decided I was going to get as much data from ESPN and, and all these other sites as I could. And so before I knew it, um, a couple of weeks before the draft, I had this intricate Excel as like, again, like 13 or 14 years old, I had my dad helping me. I had this like very intricate Excel spreadsheet of all these different stats and, and draft positions and stuff like that. And from that moment on, I just always kind of loved how sports and data just meshed so well, since I loved both of them. And at the time, I didn't know I loved data. I was, you know, just a kid, but just something about it brought me joy, like this, this joyous feeling inside. And so, you know, I, I continued to do my thing in terms of Excel spreadsheets and stats and data for football and baseball at the time. I wasn't in love with basketball yet. Um, and I carried that all the way through uh, college. And so I ended up going to Moorhead State University. I started out in sport management, thinking it would put me in the front office of a, a baseball team or a football team. I quickly realized that was not the case. A professor actually sat me down and said, you do realize that if you get a sport management degree, you're going to be working 100 hour weeks starting out potentially for free. And I said, no, I thought I was going to be in the draft room for the Cincinnati Reds. And I was going to be picking all the prospects. He said, it's not how it works. So I switched to finance. And at the, about the same time I switched to finance to get a corporate finance degree, I fell in love with daily fantasy sports. And again, daily fantasy sports is an area where you can really get into the data. You can build spreadsheets and pricing models. It's almost as if each player is a stock and you have to analyze their price and whether or not they're worth it. And that's when in back in 2000, I believe it was 2012, December of 2012, I started my daily fantasy sports advisor podcast. So this was nine years ago. Um, Draft Street was around at the time. And so I did, I did a, a weekly podcast where I would analyze all the players, all their prices. And again, just kind of, again, meshing that data and that sports together. And, and, and flash forward to now, um, as we've, you alluded to, 
as a as a father, as a, a husband, as a full time employee working as an analyst, I just didn't have the time for daily fantasy sports. It is actually very time consuming if you take it seriously. seriously. But then I fell in love with cards, which I had always done with my dad growing up. And I realized that there's so much more data now than there was back in the 90s when I was growing up around cards, around, you know, sports memorabilia. And, and with it not being as um, time consuming and demanding as daily fantasy sports, all of that energy has kind of been transferred over to sports cards. And so, um, you know, data and all of these side jobs and, and these side passions and projects for me have always been a way to sharpen my skills as an analyst which in my day job, I don't have the pleasure of working with sports data, which I enjoy. And so if you are going to be, you know, for me to spend eight hours a day doing non-sports data work, for me to continue to do another four to 10 or 20 hours in a week, it's got to be something I enjoy. And, and that sports is that thing for me. So sports has helped me both shape, um, you know, my love for for data and, 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 and how I can use it to better my my life and my career and data has been a bridge into sports that allows me to feel close to it without actually playing the games or being in a city with a big sports team. Um, although now that I live in Charlotte, I can root for our teams, but um, it's just, it's been a match made in heaven really since I was 14 years old. And I just, I can't stop doing it. <laughs> I, I love that. And you know, it's, it's so cool that you can have uh, sports and your work be complementary like that, right? you know, you, you're, you're learning things in your work and you can apply them to sports and understand the, whatever game it is that you're trying to understand better. But you can also take those learnings when you're analyzing that sports data and bring it back to your work. It's like this really cool, positive feedback loop, which I think we all try to hope to find. And that's one of the reasons why I'm always pushing people to, to work on projects or things outside that they really are passionate about. They want to understand better because you're right, dipping into the tank and and finding that energy is really difficult if if it's the, if there's no uh, broader like personal intrinsic interest associated with it. Before we jump into the sports uh, specific analysis and and your journey into into that field, I'd love to learn about how you made that transition, you know, from a finance student into a, a analyst role, and you know, kind of some of the skills you acquired and what that what that path looked like. Yeah, so uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, get a get a job at J.P. Morgan Chase out of college, and and funny enough, this is a good life lesson for for me. It was a great life lesson for me, and a great life lesson for I think a lot of people. The I actually didn't apply for the job, but they pulled my resume from an internship that I actually got denied for. So my junior summer, I applied for an internship at J.P. Morgan Chase in their private bank, made it to the final round of interviews. And they basically said, sorry, but we went with another candidate. And so, um, you know, I went along with my senior year uh, to, to obviously graduate with a corporate finance degree and then hit the job market. And on my spring break, my senior year, they called me and said, hey, we just pulled your resume from an old pile for internships. We've got a couple openings in Columbus. Do you want to come interview? And so I interviewed and I got a job as a closing analyst, which actually isn't a data driven job. So all I was really doing was filling out loan packages for home equity lines of credit and, and home equity loans, he loans. And so it was basically, okay, what state am I in? And then you would fill basically like, what do they call them? Mad Lib, where you basically have these, you know, hundred page documents and you fill in different fields based off of, you know, what, whatever that client was and the state was and all that kind of stuff. But as I was in that role, I had, become pretty friendly with a couple of guys on the reporting team. And I was kind of learning about the stuff they were doing. And, and I asked them, hey, how can I get in there? I mean, I don't, I have a corporate finance degree, but I don't necessarily have any classical training in, in data and analytics. And one of them suggested that I start doing some of the data analytics work within my, my space, and then show that to both my manager and the reporting manager and say, hey guys, you know, I'd love to get in and here's what I can do. And obviously, I've been training for this moment my entire life since we were, I was 14 years old, like we just talked about. So I created these scorecards for the preliminary teams, the underwriting teams and the closing teams. And so basically what we did was we did a time study to take, you know, how long it took to do different tasks. And I basically created scorecards for management to show who was, you know, the most efficient and least efficient. And um, the work caught the eye of the reporting team and, and, you know, that, the reporting manager came to me one day and said, Hey, we got an opening. 
were, you know, would you like to apply? And so I applied and I, you know, I beat out a couple of people that I know had some, some background. And, and I think the reason why is because they had, you know, one, these people would come in with no experience and a good resume or good education, but then they've got someone over here that did all that work has shown a need and a want to be there. And so I ended up getting the job and, and, you know, two lessons from that are one, you know, you sometimes have to put in work beforehand, like you've talked about, do those side projects, build a portfolio that you can actually actually present to somebody and say, hey, here's the work I can do, because then they don't have to take as much of a chance on you. They can say, look, I have it in front of me. They know how to do it. And also have a conversation with your manager when you do get in at an entry level job, if that's the only opportunity you have, and be honest about where you want to go. My manager at the time that they needed to said, yes, I, you know, I, preach for his work ethic. He's a great employee. And of course, this means that my manager was going to lose a resource. She was going to lose a headcount. She was going to have to fill my role. But because that honest communication was there, she allowed me to make that jump into reporting and analytics uh, three years into my career. And the rest is history. I've never left the space since. Now, a quick word from this episode's sponsor, Pandio. Taking advantage of machine learning doesn't just mean that you have a lot of data. It means that you have the ability to access to query, and to move that data in a seamless manner across your enterprise. Pandio is the only data orchestration layer that enables you to connect different data sources, query data in place as if it were a single database, and move that data at scale. Let your data science teams focus on optimizing the models for data-driven decisions, and let Pandio focus on the logistics. Go to pandio.com, that's P-A-N-D-I-O.com, for a free trial to see how Pandio can drive massive value for your data transformation. Now back to the episode. I'm getting goosebumps. I love that story so much. <laughs> I mean, that that's something I cannot stress enough is that you have a position, like move laterally, internally, like create that good relationship within your company. I mean, the I would hope almost every, every company should wanna keep their employees happy, keep them producing at a, at a really high level. And if, you know, you want to take on more responsibility. If you want to do more advanced things, they should be enabling you to do that. And it's not like that in every company, but for the most yeah. part, if you have a good relationship, you're doing good work and you're trying to expand your skills, who's going to be like, no, don't, don't learn more things. Don't create more value for our company. Right. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is you also never know unless you ask. I mean, so many people are, are, they're too scared to ask. They just want to go outside of their company. They're like, oh, I'm applying for these things. So it's like, you know, I, in every single role out there, I would argue there is something data related you could do, whether, you know, even if you're a cashier at a grocery store, there is something related to data that you could be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's like tracking how many times people buy milk, I don't know, but like yeah. it, there has to be opportunities there and showing that initiative that you can tackle some of those problems is also an incredible, you know, value add as well. That's something that's highly, highly desirable that you can't exactly see in a interview candidate. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And you, you said a couple of things that are very important there. I took a lateral move into reporting. So I spent two plus years trying to show them that I could be a part of the reporting analytics team. It's not like I got a raise or a promotion. They said, okay, you've earned a chance to prove to us that you can do it. And so, um, you know, I, I've, Early on in my career, I kind of switched my perspective on life from how much money will this make me or how much money can I make doing this to like, what's my path to spending the most amount of time doing things I enjoy? Like if, if, the, if the currency is how much, how many minutes you spend doing things you like, in the end, that ends up earning you more money because you're actually ending up, you know, you get better at it because you enjoy doing it. And it's, it's a whole self-fulfilling prophecy of, if I spend as much time as I can doing something I love, in the end, the money will take care of itself. The success will take care of itself. And if it doesn't, at least I'm enjoying what I'm doing. If you end up chasing a paycheck, doing something you don't like, and the paycheck never comes, you've now, I mean, that's the ultimate loss or L in my opinion. And so that's one important thing you said there. You can't always make it about the money. There's always got to be some other guiding light that you have to follow. And yeah, you just have to sometimes prove to people that you can do it. Because as a hiring manager, no matter how good your interview questions are, no matter how good the resume is, they're taking a chance. There's a lot of unknowns when hiring an employee. I now work in the talent acquisition space, which we can get into later. 
but turnover is a real issue, right? I mean, sometimes you just hire the wrong person. And so the more information you give to somebody that basically uncovers a lot of those unknowns, the better chance you're going to get the job, regardless if you're going up against somebody with a data science degree from, you know, Duke or Northwestern or something. I mean, if you can prove to them, hey, what you need me to do, I've already done here for free on my own time. That's as good as, in my opinion, a couple of lines on a resume that says you, you know, graduated with a 3.5 from Northwestern. Yeah, well, and you alluded to it too. There is less risk hiring internally, right? They already have hired you. You're already on staff. You don't have to do all the onboarding. You have to do all these things. And at the very worst, they're just like, go back and do your other job, right? Like, <laughs> like it, that, that's something I think that I, I really want to stress is that, um, you know, if you're thinking about it from the other end, you know, I'm, I'm hiring someone, you know, there's a lot of question marks bringing someone in from the outside rather than just, just transferring someone in who, who can have all of those internal references. Mm-hmm. Um, something else you'd mentioned that I... I really wanted to highlight, oh, I lost my train of thought. So let's keep going and I'll probably come back to it. But um, so in in this realm, when you're doing these projects, I guess, outside of, um, outside of your main work, how did you start, you know, blogging? How did you start getting picked up? How were you able to write for some of these online publications like Roto Grinders? What did that progression look like? I know you, you've had quite a, a few columns or notable, notable articles within those communities. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you start that process? So I started, my start was on, uh, YouTube and, uh, as a podcast. Now I had to learn all of that myself. So it it really all started with, I had this Excel spreadsheet for daily fantasy sports that I knew people would want. I spent so much time on it, but why not give it out you know, to people for free. I mean, I spend all this time on it. I could save someone else a lot of time. And so I bought a, you know, a, a, a cheap microphone. I think it was like 50 bucks um, and a Logitech webcam again, under a hundred bucks, like 80 bucks. And I basically just started recording my audio and my video all at the same time while reviewing the Excel spreadsheet. And then I would post the video portion to YouTube and I would, you know, send out my podcast and, I just started there and I started from zero subscribers and zero listeners. And I think at its peak, my podcast had 900 listeners, which to me at the time was, was really, really great. And, you know, my, my YouTube channel got, I was able to get monetized at some point. I mean, it's not easy now to get monetized, but you know, I did break the threshold of getting monetized. And so I just started that way. And then, you know, when you start to look at uh, working for a publication like Rotor Grinders, I actually reached out to them for a data set that they had. It was called the results DB and it would basically track all the results from the previous day's contests. So how, what players were owned at what percentage, what salaries, you know, these players were and, and who won the contest. And all I did was send an email to support and said, Hey, I, I love this data set. Is there any way for me to get access to it and to provide content for the community? And, and actually it's funny. I didn't know this at the time, but the, the found, like one of the founders called me a week later and said, Hey, we saw you were asking about this data set. I looked you up on LinkedIn. It looks like you might have a skill set we need. We're actually looking to create content around this data set and we don't have anybody in house to do it. And so I started working as a contractor for Roto Grinders. They said, basically, here's the access you wanted. All, you know, it, we'll actually pay you not, not a huge sum, but we'll pay you to, to pull the data out and help us write some articles around it. And so I was, I was not necessarily a ghost writer per se, but I would actually, you know, hit the database for data with queries and, and provide charts and, and numbers to some of the writers over there at Roto Grinders. And then eventually when uh, sports cards came around, they said, Hey, we love the work you're doing here. You seem to be passionate about sports cards. You actually want to write some articles yourselves. And I said, Sure. And so I started writing for them that way. And so that was another area where I just asked a question. Somebody came to me with an opportunity and I had to prove it to them as a contractor. They could have said, no, this guy's not working out. And in 30 days just ditched me. But um, I've been on Roto Grinders, I think well over a year now, maybe even closing in on two um, really kind of as a behind the scenes data analyst, data consultant for them. Um, But I was just in the right place at the right time again. And so this comes down to building your network and connections and 
And I was just fortunate enough to, and, and of course the YouTube and the blog stuff didn't hurt. I mean, they knew I could write at least at a decent level for them. And so now I've had that opportunity and, and is it going to be a, a long-term career changing opportunity? Probably not. Maybe it's a great website and I love working there, but to have this on my resume and as a part of, you know, my profile and my portfolio is great because now you know, I can forever take that and say, I've done this as well. It's just another diverse opportunity I've had and it, it, it right place, right time connections, networks. And again, just having a portfolio of work to fall back on when you get that opportunity, if you're in the right place in the right time, if you don't have that thing to point back to and say, yes, I can do the work you're asking me to do. It's going to be very tough to convince them that, you know, they should take a chance on you. Yeah. You know, I love that. And something that I keep hearing you repeat is right place and right time, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, the more things that you produce, the more you put yourself out there, the more you network, the more often you're in the right place at the right time. So it's not necessarily something that you don't have control over. That's something that we can actually influence. You know, the more we're um, communicating with people that we find interesting on LinkedIn or creating value for other people or, or just producing things that we think are fun, if we enjoy what we're making, the odds are that someone else is also going to enjoy what we're making there as well. And I remembered what I was going to say quite some time ago, and I think it all really does tie back to what you're saying here. And it was when you were talking about um, you're looking at value outside of financial value. So where you get enjoyment, how much um, time you're going to spend on doing things you enjoy versus things that you don't enjoy. And obviously, this is one of the things you enjoy. You take time out of your day not during your work hours, but in your leisure hours to do these types of things. And I, to me, that's, that's so important because when you do that, you're investing in your longer term um, growth, right? It, it's very easy to trade that investment off for short term uh, capital and finances and whatever that is. And, you know, I've, I've done something very similar where, you know, I, I could probably be working at one of these larger companies as the data scientist or manager and making significantly more money but the way I see it is if I'm investing time now, creating content, meeting people, growing my, my own, I guess, like kind of business outside of the main work that I'm doing that allows me a lot of flexibility. Uh, yes, I'm absolutely probably not going to get egregiously wealthy, which has never been my concern. But in the longer term, the upside for doing things that I love is so much higher. One, in terms of quality of life, just the amount of freedom and the amount of energy that I bring but also potentially financially, right? If, if you make a company yourself, it's possible to grow year over year, um, you know, double your income year over year versus when you're working at a normal company, what, what's the best you're going to get? A 20% raise, 10% raise? Um, 20% you know, is good. Yeah, 20% is per- absurdly good. Yeah, yes. 20% is absurdly good. 10% is a pretty fair raise and your merit is just enough to cancel out inflation. So if you're if you're following along as baseline in the corporate world, your salary increases will probably just meet or slightly exceed inflation. And if you're doing really good, uh, you could maybe get a 20% raise every two years, maybe. Of course, promotions are different, but promotions come with more responsibility. The, the higher you're up in the food chain in the corporate world, the more hours and stress you're going to spend on that job. And it's it's in my opinion, critical to love what you're doing, if that's the case. And, um, you know, just again, like what, what you said there, like, I don't think any of us really need to be egregiously wealthy, especially if you changed your internal compass to say, like, I want to be wealthy in minutes spent doing things I love versus I want to be so wealthy. I can buy a, a, a the best version of Tesla that I can buy. So, um, yeah, I, I think everything you've just said is is, is spot on. And it, it's also, as you say that, you build your own business. And I think you have that skill and that passion for that. It's completely okay not to be that person. Entre- being an entrepreneur right now is really just, it's kind of cool. It's like in, but it's, it's okay to be someone who needs that nine to five and who needs that consistent check and that stability. You can still, and I've, I've lived both lives. I'm, I'm actually living both lives right now, you can find a corporate job that you love and that feels like an entrepreneurial, uh, you know, place, just know that your ceiling is going to be a little bit lower, as you just mentioned, 
But again, if you don't care about the money, if you find a nine to five job that gives you a steady income that pays the bills, puts food on the table, and you love what you're doing and the people you work with, that's a win. You, not everybody has to be a business owner or an entrepreneur. Some people are really good at being the 1,001st best person at a 100,000 first company. You're still in the top 1%. It's just, you just weren't cut out to be you know, the CEO founder and startups are a completely different world that, you know, you are probably more familiar with than I am, but it's completely okay to live a nine to five life. You still should be searching for all the same things we're talking about. No, I, I agree 100%. And, you know, on the other side of that, I, you can 100% do both, you know, just doing blogging on the weekends, doing any of those things, you can see growth in that area. I, I think mm-hmm. the most important thing that, that I've struggled with when I've been working in traditional nine to five companies, or, or I still technically, I wouldn't say it's a nine to five job, but because I, I, but I work, you know, 40 yeah. hours a week, roughly, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. do it whenever I want. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but to me, the most important thing in, in any role is being able to see that growth and see the impact you're making. And to me, it's always a little bit easier to see impact outside of the nine to five. If you're in a nine to five where you can really see that progression, you can see how what you've been doing is contributing to the company or to your own growth. That's an unbelievable situation. You should really, you know, strive to keep that or grow in that role. But if you're struggling with that in your position, you know, doing something outside of that, you can get that same feeling and find balance across those things. It might be harder if you have a family, if you have some of these other constraints, but you know, there's absolutely no one right way to do this. And it's about finding mm-hmm. where that balance is or where that opportunity is for you to get those feelings in any part of your life. You know, it could be that, you know, uh, it's not even a work-related thing where you're seeing that growth on a personal level because of fitness or nutrition or something. And uh, that's all you need. You just are feeling that growth somewhere. The st- sorry, the stagnation for me is just like a big thing in my life that you want to try to avoid. You always want to see those little steps up. Yeah, hundred percent. And when you're doing something on your own um, outside of the confines of a, a nine to five corporate job, you have so much more, um, so much more control over what direction that goes and what the end result is. And like you said, it doesn't have to be, you know, related to work or money or, or content. Even um, my, you know, my father-in-law has told me a story about someone who basically retired or, or they took, you know, they, they took a lesser job and, and opened up free time for themselves to go um, help with Habitat for Humanity and build homes. And it was a, it was a dual value for them because one, they were helping build homes for people who need them, but also they were learning, how, they were learning the skills of, you know, how to build a home. These were skills they didn't have. And so they found a thing that they could do outside of work that allowed them to pick up a skill, which was, you know, contract type building homes and, and repairs and stuff like that while also giving back. And, and it's a volunteer job, obviously. So there's no money exchanging hands, but what was being exchanged was time for, for knowledge. Cause you know, when, what they would do is they would go and they would help out people with these skills that would then teach them. And so find those things, whether it be, you know, philanthropy and giving back or whether it be content creation, like you and I are both a part of, or it could be something completely different. Um, yeah, I 100% agree. The more control you have, the, the, the better you're going to be able to see that vision and execute on it. Because when you're in the corporate world, for the most part, you're locked into wherever your management and wherever the executives want to go. And the bigger the organization, the more and more watered down and muted your direct impact is. At where you, whereas you really just have to gauge what direction that big company is going and, and what every piece had to play in that. Yeah, a 100%. And, you know, to that point, let's, let's kind of steer the conversation back towards uh, something you have complete control over, which is your uh, card analysis or your, your, what I believe is called cardboard calculus, uh, yes. which, I, which I really love the name of. I, if, if I yeah. recall correctly, that's like a, a play on nylon calculus. Yes. Uh, one of the, the best basketball. Yes. One, one of the, yeah, one of, my, one of the biggest inspirations in my journey has been nylon calculus. Uh, the work they do is phenomenal. They have some really skilled people over there. And I, it just made too much sense to to pay homage to them and just come up with a, a very fancy, catchy name of, of cardboard calculus. I love that. And so, you know, you'd mentioned earlier that 
collect collecting cards has been something you were passionate about from a young age. And now there's so much more data available. You know, how big is that market? What opportunities are there? And what have you done? What are the first steps uh, to creating value with analytics in that space? Yeah, the market, the market is growing by the day. Um, I, I saw someone throw a number out there a while ago, but I mean, we're, we're in the billions. I mean, it's, it's a multi-billion dollar market. I don't know the exact word for it, um, but it's a very big market. It's, it's growing very quickly. And um, when, I was, when I was growing up as a kid, the internet was really kind of in its, in its infancy still at least from a mark online marketplace data sharing perspective. I, I think when I think when cards really started getting hot, eBay had just been around for you know a little a little while, but eBay's quite uh, changed quite a bit since then. And so now back when I was a kid, you would basically you know scrap up all your quarters, go down to the local card shop and buy a pack or buy a few cards. Now, you know, while I'm sitting on the couch and my wife's want, watching all of her shows, I have access to thousands of cards on eBay that I can go and, and buy and have the person ship it to me immediately. And so the way that we all buy and, and sell cards and exchange cards is, is completely different now than it was back in the 90s when the junk wax era happened. And I also think nowadays alternative assets are, are more welcomed as an investment. So whereas cards before were kind of a novelty, they were collectors, you know, something that kids would collect. Now they could be seen as alternative investments like art in, in crypto and, and the two worlds are kind of meshing crypto and, and cards, which we can get into later. And you've got, you know, you've got this whole economy around it now, whereas before it was really not anything like that. And so in terms of the data being created, um, grading in the sports card world, which is somewhat new, it's definitely hot right now, which is where you send your card to a third party and they, they grade the condition. They'll send you back a, a, a score from one to 10 based on how good the condition of the, it is in. And it also authenticates it. And so that what that creates is population counts, which is mainly what I've been working on right now. So every time these, the PSA, the third party grades a card, they add it to their population count. So now you can see how many cards have been graded of a certain set or a certain player, how many of those cards are grading out a gem mint, which is the best condition. So now you've got different metrics like total population, population growth, gem rates, which is how, you know, what percentage of cards get the best possible grade. And and none of that was available before. And so now you're starting to see eBay, which APIs are somewhat, you know, they're, they're familiar now for many people, especially in the data science community. API, uh, eBay has an API. So now you can get all this sales data from ABI that you, uh, eBay that you couldn't before. And so just the, the, you know, the creation of data is just insane right now in the hobby. And, and I wanted to jump in on that because very much like baseball way back in the day, as soon as the data was, was given and made publicly available, which isn't necessarily the case in sports cards right now, um, at least to the extent we'd like it, you know, so much happened so quickly. And now you've got things like fan graphs and all these crazy sports sites. And I, I know that you're familiar with all the things going on in golf and basketball. And so, you know, I'm kind of seeing that all happen in the sports card world as it kind of just recently happened in, in, in sports in general. And I just wanted to be on the front of that wave. And so using my skills as an analyst, I'm taking all the data I can um, on Instagram and basically creating data visualizations with all this data with the main purpose of what can we learn about the hobby? Because right now there's just a lot of talking and speculation and here's what I feel and here's what I think, but I really want to get down to the data and, and see what that tells us. And so I, I'm just basically consuming as many data sources as I can as they pop up and, and seeing what I can find out in the card world. That's awesome. And to everyone listening, I'm going to link all of Brennan's resources for that below. He, he has an awesome YouTube channel. He's obviously active on Instagram and he does quite a lot of blogs. Uh, I think you have a, you have a column on uh, cards at Roto Grinders. Is that correct? Yeah, I do a weekend review on Roto Grinders. So I, I typically, it slowed down recently because I had a sick child, but um, I typically will do three to five posts on Instagram and every week on Roto Grinders, I think it's like Tuesday or Wednesday to release it. I take the most interesting visualizations I did and, and kind of expand on it in blog form. So usually on Instagram, I post like a question and then the image and allow people to kind of deduce what they want to from the, the data visualizations on Roto Grinders. I kind of take those and give my take on what it means for the hobby 
what, you know, that means for that particular player or card. And it's just, in my opinion, the beauty of data visualization, which doesn't take a bunch of classical data science skills. You really just need creativity and a willingness to learn whatever visualization tool you use, Tableau, Power BI, Excel, any of it. Um, if you're a good artist, you could chart things yourself um, by hand. So that's what I love about data visualization. It's simplicity is almost what makes it so valuable and so beautiful. And I kind of like to, on Instagram, leave people hanging with what maybe they think is from it. And I'll read the comments to see what people think. And then on Rotor Grinders, I kind of give my take on it. But any two people can have different interpretations of the same visualization. Awesome. And so, you know, one thing that I also want to understand a bit better is what types of things are you trying to understand better? So like future price of a card, how, uh, for example, player popularity or player performance Im impacts card prices, uh, card prices across different brands. There's a lot of variables at play. What are some of the questions that you're really focusing on uh, answering in the short term? And then also what are some of the longer term things that you'd like to better understand? Yeah, the short term low hanging fruit is if, if you go back to my fin finance background and cards as an alternative asset is what drives price and what drives price movement. Um, you know, population count is one of the things that I think is most interesting right now, because if you think of a card as a stock, you know, Tesla, you know, in a, in a weird world might have 100,000 shares all valued at a dollar. So your market cap for that company would be 100,000. Now, in the sports card world, which doesn't happen in the stock market world, is every day the out number of outstanding shares goes up because PSA grades more and more cards. So in the stock world, you might call it a stock split. So you know this company that has 100,000 shares at a dollar might say, you know what, we're splitting our stock. Tomorrow, there's going to be 200,000 shares available, and all of them go down to 50 cents. Now the car, the company would still be valued at hundred thousand dollars, 200,000 times the 50 cents, but you know, the price went down and, and what you're seeing in the card world is everybody's freaking out as these prices are going down, not realizing that the demand is still high. It's just supply is increasing by the day. And so, you know, understanding what population counts mean to the price of a card and whether or not cards are really less desirable than they were before, or there's just more available and the, the, you know, supply and demand is kicking in. And then again, you know, okay, if that's the case, if, if an increasing supply is bad, what brands are growing the least? And one thing I've learned early on here is that select, which is one of the brands of cards is only available in local card shops. It's not available in target and Walmart. And so Prism, which is another one of the big sets, is available on Target and Walmart, which means there needs to be more product to, sac uh, to satisfy the demand. And so what I've learned, one of the most important things I've learned so far is that if you want to protect yourself from an increasing population day over day of that card, the supply of that card, going for Select, which is only available in hobby shops, is a safer route because it's only growing by 100 or so every month versus a couple of thousand. And so that's one of the things, you know, the examples that we've uncovered so far that is really important. And then you start to get into the weeds of the card world, which is there's different parallels of the same card. So which parallel is more rare, which parallel is growing lower. And so pop counts alone can be its own project that I could probably go on for many months. Um, but, an, a, you know, another thing I'd like to learn is, you know, what, you know, what makes a player most desirable? I'd say it was performance, but you've got cards like Carmelo Anthony, who in reality has not done as much in his career as, as some other players, but Carmelo Anthony played for a big market team in New York. He, you know, had a lot of great moments for the Olympics team. He has his own shoe. So, you know, understanding what drives price just in general would be very helpful as well. It's, it's a project I'd love to work on with you in the future, right? What's, what's the data set we can come up with and what kind of regression model can we build to say, all right, if this player has, you know, from a data perspective, X amount of win shares, which is a, you know, a very popular metric in the basketball world, plus Twitter followers, plus hours viewed on YouTube, plus, you know, market size. I mean, when you start to think of all these things in a type of regression model, you could do to forecast price or identify above and below valued players. These are all things that I think have been uncovered in sports and then covered in the stock market that, will now apply to sports cards. And I kind of want to cover as much as possible to be quite honest with you. 
Awesome. Oh, I love that so much. There's so many, I guess, like cool intricacies of, of the field and, and what's possible there. I yeah. think something that, that I'm also very interested in is understanding uh, what could potentially be the future of this industry as well. You know, um, NFTs are becoming relatively popular these days. Um, another question that I had before we kind of, I get your perspective on NFTs and Top Shot like that is, is there a certain point where the population of a card stops? So, you know, like, you know, they've, is there like a 2020 series of cards and that ends at a certain period of time or are these things always, populations always increasing? Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. One of the things that I have found is, so the way that cards work is every, every year you've got a, so one thing to keep in mind is a, a person's rookie card is the most important card that you could buy for the most part. So when they're rookie year, so for instance, LeBron James's rookie year was in 2003. Uh, Tops and Upper Deck at the time released a bunch of different sets in 2003, but once 2004 rolls around, there's no more LeBron rookie sets created. That the supply is done. Now that the problem is, people will buy the boxes but not open them. So you could have sealed boxes from 2003, LeBron's rookie year, that haven't been opened yet. So in theory, someone could one day open that, and there'd be a new LeBron James rookie in the market that wasn't before. And you also have people slowly, you know, having kept the cards ungraded for a long time and grading them. So in theory, it's always possible for a new card to hit the population count. But what I'm finding is population growth is in the double digits month over month in the first three years of a set. And once you've hit year four, five, and six away from that set being released, that player's rookie year being released, the growth slows down into the low single digits. And so the population really starts to level out three to four to five years into a guy's career. Whereas, you know, right now we're seeing 2018, 2019 and 2020 population counts growing 12, 14, 20% month over month. So if you had hundred last month, you'd have 120 this month, which is, is huge. That's a huge growth, especially when you think about supply and demand and the pricing dynamics. Um, now, in the card world, it's, it's becoming very popular to get cards that are serial numbered. And what's that, what that means is the card maker is very upfront with how many of that card was made. So you'll actually have a serial number on the card that says one out of 100. So by buying those cards, it's very transparent how many of those cards there are. Um, I have a LeBron James rookie that's numbered out of 999. I know that no matter how many boxes are unbroken, how many cards are still raw and not sent into PSA, that there's only 999 of that card in the world. Um, and so that is something that a lot of people have started to move to because of these high population counts and people just don't like the uncertainty. They're actually going out and buying the cards that actually on the card say how many was printed. And in my opinion, if you can afford those, they're much more expensive. Those are the safest way because you know up front how many there are. We're starting to see tens of thousands of Luka Doncic rookies that are graded by PSA. So if you bought that very early on and you said, oh, great, there's only 5,000 graded by PSA, that population count is more than 4X over the last year. And so, you know, yes, there's times where the population growth starts to slow down, but especially for these modern sets, I think you'll all, for many years down the road, you're going to see them grow at very small amounts initially. Very cool. I mean, that's that's like a a very interesting dynamic of, of population change. I mean, you were talking about stocks earlier, like the number of shares, we know how many there are constantly. And I mm -hmm. think that that is actually a really good segue to the NFT discussion. Yeah. Um, so if I recall, NFT stand for non-fungible tokens. Non-fungible token. Yep. Correct. Okay. And a, a lot of people are trading sports highlights, art, these types of things, very similar to trading cards online. And if I understand correctly, also NFTs don't have that issue where new population comes randomly uh, unless someone's issuing another like piece of art or something like that. But, you know, I can, I can sell 600, um, you know, uh, I guess shares or, or NFTs of me hitting a golf ball. There aren't going to be more than 600 that are out there. Obviously there's other issues with digital goods, but what do you yeah. think of the future of that? You know, is that still like really, really early on too early on to tell, or is there going to be, um, you know, is there going to be an explosion of that in the next couple of years or is it all hype, you know? Uh, so I think, 
I think we're really early on to tell what it's going to look like in the future, but I think it's it's here to stay. And and I know that NFT, the beauty about blockchain is there's a lot of transparency. You can track how, again, what the, like Panini will never, which is the main card maker in basketball, will never come out and give us an Excel spreadsheet of the print runs of all of their cards. When it comes to NFTs and the blockchain, you're going to be able to know how many of something is out there. It's going to be no surprise um, how many are minted, how many are still in packs, how many are, have been pulled and are in collections. I mean, that's all stuff you can get for NBA Top Shot, which is the big NFT for sports right now. And so I think it's too early on to tell what it's going to look like in the future. I think it's here to stay. And I definitely think it's going to be an ecosystem that people can enjoy. And I'm fairly certain that once this initial hype does die down, there's going to be money to be made as well. Now, I think 90% of what's out there right now is overpriced because just there's not enough supply. I mean, if you think about it, we're, we're still in year one, year two of, of this whole thing. And so, you know, as, as the companies start to release more and more product, you know, it's going to water itself down. There's going to be, you know, more LeBron James moments, more Giannis Antetokounmpo moments. There's going to be more crypto punks and, and artwork. And so, you know, as more and more come out, the prices of everything that came before it is going to go down on most things. And so I think when a lot of people just, and I was, I actually was um, guilty of this when cryptocurrencies first came out and I'm not an investor in cryptocurrency right now, but I'm more accepting of it than I was before. I assumed since I didn't understand it or welcome it that nobody would. And, and so if you talk to somebody that is in their 40s, 50s, 60s, they might you know, look at it and say, that's the silliest thing I have ever seen. But when you think about it, that's not the generation that is going to make or break NFTs. The, the generations that will make or break the success of NFTs are the younger generations and they're much more welcoming of it. So I think, you know, I, I've always tried to take an open mind to these things. I actually am a big fan of NFTs and the idea of collecting things. One thing that dawned on me was, you know, someone said, well, yeah, but I can't hold the NFT. But what if I had a picture frame that had my wallet ID in it and it could just cycle through all of my NFTs in my man cave? So when people come over, they see that LeBron James dunk, but they can't see that anywhere else on any, anybody else's wall or the only a hundred other people that have that NFT because I own that video clip. And so I can start to think of these digital picture frames that show all of your collectibles and, and you can share them with people. And so I actually see a path forward for NFTs to be big and, and to work. I think un, unfortunately right now it's just so early and there's so much hype around it that we are due for a pullback. We've seen pullbacks in crypto. We've seen pullback in stocks. We've, every market is due for pullbacks we're definitely in a hype cycle right now for NFTs. People are talking about it that, you know, weren't talking about it yesterday and people are getting in maybe because of fear of missing out. Um, but long-term, I love the landscape of NFT. I'm not getting into it yet. I'm waiting for it to, to come back to realistic standards. But, you know, the idea of owning a video clip for some might be something that makes no sense. I can just go watch it on YouTube. But I Again, I think that, you know, when you think about all the money that's been spent on games like World of Warcraft, and I play NBA 2K, my team, and people spend money all the time on that. And that's a game that resets every year. You lose that progress. You've got things like League of Legends and all these other digital things where people collect skins and, and, and wallpapers. I mean, this is an ecosystem that's been around for a while. People pay money for this stuff. It's, it, they're, it, they're interested in this stuff. Um, so rather than discounting it, I think if, you're, if anybody's still on the fence about it, I would just learn about it. And it's completely okay not to ever get into it. Their NFTs aren't going to be the only ways to make money in the future. NFTs aren't going to be the only things to enjoy time in the future. Everybody's got their own thing. I think NFTs are going to have a very big audience though, over the next 10 to, to 20 years. And I think it's all about where the money's at generationally. Um, and that's why sports cards are booming. I, I, I didn't grow up with art or stamps or coins. I grew up with cards. So now that I have more disposable income, I'm spending that on cards. There are young kids, kids younger than I am. I'm you know 31 now. There's kids that are 18, 17, 16 that are going to start getting jobs out of college. They're going to get more disposable income. Those are the people that are going to be buying NFTs. Those are going to people be the pop, people buying cryptocurrency. If you can convince a 16 or 18 year old to go buy a bullion of gold or silver. I mean, more power to you, but when they look at alternative investments, they want the crypto, they want the NFTs. And so I see this being a thing in the future, if not only because generations change and, and the generations that are now coming into money and coming into jobs, 
like these digital things. Yeah, uh, you know, there's something that I, I really like that you had hidden in there and you were talking about stamps and coins and cards. I think it's useful to pay attention to these trends. Like people of all ages historically have looked to some form of alternative investments, right? And if you look at, if you strip everything else away, NFTs are alternative investments or, or things that you can look at or, or enjoy. You know, some people thumb through all their old stamps or look at the coins and, and that brings some value to them. So to me, NFTs aren't anything different. They're just the next version of collectibles that we're looking at. And so to me, that's like a big picture trend that makes sense. If you look at, at crypto, very similar, like medium of exchange sort of, um, but people looked at gold the same way historically, where this is a store of value in some way. I mean, gold prices can fluctuate dramatically if, if a new gold mine is found or something like that, right? It's, it's not that different. There's probably more volatility, but that volatility comes from accessibility, not necessarily um, the, the supply where, you know, Bitcoin or, uh, or cryptos, their supply is predictable, right? Something like gold or, or uh, you know, a, a precious metal, the supply is not predictable. So in a sense, although it is more volatile, it is in some ways more predictable, which I think is fascinating. Uh, again, like kind of big picture there though, is that, you know, look, these aren't new things, right? They're just new, uh, new versions of things that are wrapped up differently and told a different story about. Uh, in terms of NFTs, as, a, as content creators, like I see tremendous value in, you know, owning B-roll or being able to, to use footage at a more affordable rate. I mean, you, a lot of the times you, you shine up for Shutterstock or, or some of these places, and it's expensive to buy B-roll of, of certain things. If some amateur photographer has some cool B-roll that I like, and they're selling it for a dollar, like that to me is effective and I get to reuse that whenever I want and I have ownership over it at a certain point. And so there's a really tangible use case for me in that circumstance. And, you know, I'm licensing it, I'm using it, I own the footage. In content creation in general and Twitch and all these different platforms, that's like one of the biggest issues right now is the copyright and the, the legal aspect. I'm not gonna say this is gonna go in and solve all of that, but it does kind of shine a light on a pathway forward where you might have a lot more clarity around who owns what uh, if they're all based on NFTs, right? Yeah, I love that. I never thought of that as a use case, but I, I, like, in my opinion, NFTs for something like a, a crypto punk, which is just be basically a digital painting is very much an alternative investment with very little intrinsic value. But what you just explained is taking something that me as an artist, whether it be photography, B-roll, a musician, it takes something that has a value and I can then monetize it in a way that I never could before. It gives you more control over who has access to it. It gives you more control of the revenue stream. And I'm thinking about recently, I think a DJ or some artist created a song that only had a limited print run and basically made it available to all of his fans. And so now if you're a fan of some artist or, or some you know, painter or musician, like that's one way you can connect to the artist that you never could before. And, and no one can take that away from you because you own that NFT and that token. And yeah, I mean, I think we're going to start to learn about NFTs and how they can truly be used in the future. That's why, you know, people, people think gold is, has like an, an industrial value. It really doesn't. It's used for some jewelry, but otherwise people just agree that it's worth money because they agree that it's worth money. And it, it used to be the gold standard and, and so on and so forth. You know, whereas Ethereum in the crypto space has the smart contracts and has all these things that I find very interesting. Like what if Airbnb, you know, comes up with this thing where I can, you know, buy a day at a certain location. I walk up with my phone and, and basically the smart contract says, okay, yeah, you own this house for the next day. And you just basically walk in because on, you know, Ethereum and the smart contracts, they know you own that Airbnb for a day, no exchange of keys, nothing like that. Um, you don't have to change the code every time you walk in. And so I, I think what we're going to start to learn is there's a lot of use cases, like you said, for these NFTs and these cryptocurrencies that we're going to know more about in the future. I'm a little bit old school, so I like love holding the card in my hand. But there was actually a, a new site called Dibs, which basically takes cards 
that are otherwise out of people's, uh, you know, out of people's reach from a price perspective. It might be a $10,000 LeBron rookie. And it basically, this, this is all built on the Ethereum platform. They, they keep the card in a vault and then break it into like a thousand different NFTs. And so what you're doing is you're buying a fraction of that card on the app dips. And so basically they've taken a physical card, kind of like we used to do with the gold standard. And these NFTs are basically a promise for X percent of that card. And so I can buy 5% of a LeBron James rookie card that I can't actually own myself outright because I can't afford it but I can still feel like I'm watching him on a game day. And as the value of his card goes up, the value of my NFTs, my fractional shares go up. And so a, another reason why, like you just said, there's going to be use cases we didn't think about. I never thought about taking a $10,000 card, breaking it into 10,000 NFTs and selling those NFTs for a dollar. I never thought about that, but I mean, that's just how this life is changing. And so um, alternative invest investments, I think are here to stay. And like you said, that could be an NFT, that could be a crypto, that could be a card, that could be, it still could be stamps. Some people still might like to collect stamps. The market for that is going to be lower because of all the generational things we talked about. But, you know, I, I just think uh, the world is going to change a lot. And I, it was kind of expedited by everything we've been through over the last couple of years. But, you know, we're starting to see different trends emerge, like you said, and rather than completely dismiss them, if you're not convinced, I would just learn as much as possible and then make a decision. If you haven't committed, I'd say a hundred hours of your time to learn something before you've made a decision, you're probably making a decision too early. I did that with crypto. I owned Bitcoin five years ago. I sold it because I didn't believe in it. I didn't understand it. I'm upset, but that's because I was short-minded and I, I kind of dismissed the trend and it's perfectly okay to after those hundred hours, dismiss it and say, you know what? I still just don't understand it because no one should ever invest money especially a significant amount of money in something they don't trust, understand, or are confident in long-term. And, and that's, that's my soapbox feel, I guess, on that. No, I, I agree a hundred percent. And I think that if you're going to be on the other side of that, where you do invest money without fully understanding something, you have to be okay with losing that money. I mean, that's kind of how I felt with Bitcoin or some of the other alternative investments. It's like, okay, I'm taking, you know, a thousand dollars and, I'm going to try and experiment with these things. I'm going to see what they do. And I know that this could be worth, I could lose all of this, but like, I have to be mentally okay with that if I'm going to do that. And, you know, if you're like, oh, this is going to be the, the future. I'm so certain this is going to happen. Nobody knows what the future is. You know, no, nobody knows if, if something will go up in value or go down in value. We've seen so many times, you look at historically like Enron, was arguably one of, you know, five years in a row, they won most innovative company ever. And then a week later, they disappear from the face of the earth, right? So yep. um, if you're investing, uh, you know, I, I don't give investing advice, but that's my philosophy is, <laughs> is some things are a little more certain, but if you're yep. going to invest in some of the alternative investments when you're short-sighted, definitely uh, do it with a grain of salt. Uh, so there's there's one last topic of conversation, I guess, while we're talking about kind of worlds changing and, and evolving and developing. I, I think it's really interesting to hear about, you know, you're, you're a new father. You have a lot of things going on, your work, fatherhood, the, the stuff you're doing outside blogging and doing card analysis. How do you balance all those things? What are some of the things you've learned? I mean, that's something I'll eventually hopefully have to go through. And so I want to be as prepared as possible. Yeah. So uh, early, early on before, when it was just me and my wife, it was a lot of, of give and take. And we just would have a lot of conversations about how much is too much time to spend on these side jobs and how much time should I peel back and, and just try to disconnect myself from those things. And it's very hard for me. I like, admittedly, I'm a little bit of a workaholic, but again, that comes back to doing things that I love. I just like, I enjoy it so much. I, I find it hard to stop sometimes. Um, but what I found is you just have to make a lot of sacrifices. And so to put it into perspective, uh, when I first started my daily fantasy sports advisor podcast, I would get up at 4 a.m. before my nine to five and basically get it all done before seven when I left for work. So I knew I had three hours to do a little bit of research, record the podcast, get it posted. And I learned about ways that I could save the raw files and get it posted throughout the day. So you'll pick up little tricks like that. But um, I, I can guarantee you that between four and seven, very little people will be competing for your time. So if you're someone who can find themselves to get in bed by nine or 10, 
um, which my wife's a teacher. So she has to get in bed early because school starts early. So that's not a problem for me. I'm not a night owl. I'm a morning person. But from four to seven, I would get it all done. And very little, I, I can't think of a time where my wife said, I, I need your time from four to seven in the morning. So that was one way. I find times that people don't need you. Maybe for you, it might be, okay, the family's going down for bed at, at nine or 10. I'm going to stay up till midnight and, and do it that way. And maybe you get your six to eight hours of sleep from midnight to eight or seven. So you'll find those different times. I also find, found that I had to go through and audit my time and anything that didn't get me closer to my goals, I cut out. And what I mean by that is I had goals as a, an employee. I had goals as a father and, and a husband and as a, a side hustle CEO. And so I would write all those goals down on paper and I would write all the things I spend my time on throughout the day. And if something didn't get me any closer to any of those goals, it had to go. I never watched an episode of Game of Thrones. I never did. It didn't get me to any of those goals. And I know for some people that's an escape and that gives them joy and they should carve out time for their favorite shows. But when I looked at my list of things, TV didn't get me any closer. So I, I don't watch any TV other than what my wife watches. And I kind of do work on the side on my phone while she's watching Grey's Anatomy, Station 19, Good Doctor. I mean, she watches all those stuff. And I kind of carve out time on eBay, look for card stuff. And, and I check Instagram for different things. I read articles. So, you know, having an honest conversation with the people in your life that you are going to have to share your time with and understanding what they're okay with and, and what they're not okay with is very important and cutting out things. I very, you know, video games had to go cards had to go. If I golfed or not cards, um, uh, shows had to go cards did not go. It's a key. They keep coming. Um, things like if you, and this is, this is, very, this is very important for me too. Time is time is money and money is time. So, I would used to go at everything myself. So if I wanted to write a web scraper, I might, you know, spend half of a Saturday trying to learn how to scrape something off of the internet. What I found was, especially as I had more disposable income and my side businesses did generate a little bit of cash, I could save four to six hours on a weekend if I go hire somebody on Fiverr for $50 or $100 to write the web scraper for me. And so that's another thing, right? I mean, six to eight hours over the weekend with my son and my wife is worth that 50 to hundred dollars. It cost me to have them write that web scraper. And so now all I have to do is adjust that code that they wrote me based on whatever website I'm looking at. So being willing to give up a little bit of money to save a bunch of time is very important. If you want to carve out extra time for yourself and having honest conversations. And, and so now the way that my days are scheduled, you know, my, my wife and I wake up, I get my son out the door to daycare I usually have an hour or two before my nine to five starts. I get work in there. I'll usually take an hour for lunch slash side hustle stuff. And then depending, you know, I always shoot to have my nine to five stuff done by three or four because any hour that I can save myself and I write down a list of things I want to accomplish that day. Once I get those things done, I then work on my side hustle stuff. It's like a reward. And so you'll, you'll figure out what works for your own schedule and your own family and your own needs. But a lot of it comes down to sacrifice and a lot of the sacrifices on your end. And it's those things that don't ultimately, I don't do social media. I haven't updated my Facebook status in probably over a year. Um, if, if I'm on social media like Instagram or Twitter, it's usually directly related to my side hustle stuff. I don't say woke up this morning, had a bowl of Cheerios, feel great. I don't do any of that stuff. It's so my, my time is very efficient now. And that only works if you're enjoying what you're doing. If you hate what you're doing, that's not going to work. It won't last and you're going to fail in the end. Yeah. I mean, I, I love what you were saying about cutting things out and stripping it down to the bare essentials. I think it's totally fair. Just like you said that someone for, for someone, Game of Thrones might be an essential, right? Mm -hmm. That's your way of leisure. Doing that means you'll be completely focused when you shift over and do uh, your analysis or whatever that, may, that might be. For me, every Saturday, I play golf with the same group of guys that's my release. I don't think about anything work. And, you know, I could be working that day, but I like need to do that for me to feel recharged for the week. Same thing Sunday. I, I try to do a hike. I try to do something outside. Um, and, you know, I, I do work around that Sunday night. I have to prepare my newsletter and those types of things. But um, to me, those are essentials. I need to do them. I need to be physically active to be able to frankly, sit down and either record videos or do data science for most of the week. You know, that to me, it's like, okay, there are two sides of the coin. 
And for everyone, your mix of essentials is going to be a little bit different. Um, but it takes a lot of introspection and it takes some organization to sit down and look yourself in the mirror and say, what do I really need? What can't I, you know, essentially live without? And what do I need to either make me as happy as possible, make me as productive as possible? Um, you know, kind of like this, this self audit type of thing, which, um, I know it's scary to look in the mirror. So it, it does take some courage to do. Yeah. Yeah. And my wife has been very good at balancing me out. I mean, she'll push back when she feels the need to push back. And, and I need that sometimes. And um, one thing that I don't think we talk about enough is sleep is underrated. I used to try the whole four hours of sleep a night thing because I'd get two hours more of productivity. I have found that if I get six, you know, a strong seven hours of sleep, uh, especially when it's like 10 to five, like for some reason, 12 to seven, I still feel tired. 10 to five, I don't. I don't know what what it is about shifting it before midnight makes a difference, but sleep is underrated. And like you said, health is underrated. I meditate most days to clear my mind and to get ready for all of this stuff. So be willing to give back an hour or two to meditation and sleep. Cause in the end, you're going to be more productive and you're going to be happier. And I used to go out and golf every weekend. And I used to do all of those things, but when you have a family, that's the thing you kind of have to ask yourself. And it's completely okay to say, I still want to go golf with the guys and I still want to go spend time with my family, that just means you have to adjust your expectations on the side hustle stuff, or you have to work with your day job to say, you know what, I'm going to take the time from there. And so again, you've only got 24 hours in the day and just figure out what the best balance is for you. And just, you can't, you can't expect to be a Gary Vanderchuk type success story, but only spend two hours on your side hustle a week. I mean, he went the full way. I mean, Gary Vanderchuk's a type of person that'll work 25 hours a day. And he understood those, those balances. And everybody sees Gary doing what he's doing and say, I want to do that. But then they spend four hours don't on want to Madden. Do the work. Yeah. yeah, they don't want to do the work. They spend three hours playing Madden. They go out and party every weekend and they wonder why they're not Gary Vee. And you just have to be honest with yourself. Like you said, introspection, be honest. This is how much time I spend. This is how much I'm willing to give up to do it. Here's what I could reasonably expect to get on the other side. And if you're, doing, if you're self-aware and, and honest enough with yourself, you're going to be just fine. You'll win no matter what. I, I agree. And I want to double down on what you said with the sleep and the meditation. I think that we don't give our, especially with constantly being attached to electronics, we really don't give our brain enough time to recharge. I forget who said it, but I recently heard, you know, essentially like getting an hour, an extra hour of sleep is, you know, saving yourself two hours of time from a productivity mm -hmm. standpoint. And I read this book oh, called yeah. why we sleep, uh, at the, in the middle of last year. And there's so many health benefits. There's so many focus benefits. There's so many benefits from just making sure you're well rested. Uh, this year I stopped using an alarm clock when I can. Uh, I had a, I had a 6 a.m. meeting, so I had to use one today. But, um, you know, it's, it's a world of difference in how you feel and how you think and, and what you can do. And, you know, like cravings, for example, food cravings, very different for me when I get good sleep and when I don't. Uh, it's, it's, all interconnected and uh you know it, it's so weird to say but it's it's the time that we're not doing anything that that enables the time when we actually want to do something mm -hmm. 100 awesome well those are really all the questions that i had for you this was an awesome you know awesome kind of perspective on your life content we covered a lot of stuff uh, cards whatever that might be um at the end of each interview, I like to open the floor for you to talk about anything that you'd like to. You can talk about some of the things you're working on. We obviously talked about a lot of those, but if there's anything in particular uh, that you want to advice you want to give, any of those types of things, the floor is yours. Sure. Yeah. So most, I would say that if you want to follow my work in the sports card world, the best place to do it is on Instagram, uh, cardboard dot calculus. So there's a period there, not a space or underscore. And uh, you can also follow me on YouTube uh, just under Brennan Ruby. Uh, I get less YouTube content out just because it's more time consuming. And Instagram lends itself to the data visualizations, which I love. Um, in terms of advice that I have for people, I, you said it very early on in this, and I don't want it to get lost. If you have a passion and enjoy something, there's, there's very much a chance that other people will enjoy it too. So if you love Scrabble or if you're a fan of, I don't know. I'm looking at leaves outside. Like you could be a leaf photographer or you could be an expert on leaves. I guarantee you can create content that people 
would love to watch and to see, especially since we're all at home, many of us working remotely. I've got YouTube up on just repeat behind my computer and I'm watching things from people who go to thrift shops and lost their job during the pandemic. And they're now all of a sudden making more than they did at their full income, you know, reselling stuff online. And so, you know, create content about things that you like and what you love and it'll all work out in the end. That's my advice. It all goes back to how much time am I spending doing something I love? Um, I like, I couldn't even imagine how many hours I've spent on content, cards, DFS, fantasy over the years. But it doesn't feel like doesn't feel like as many hours as I'm sure it's been because I've loved every second of it. And so um, I would just do that. You've got to have me back on so we can talk about the other side of the, the data science card hobby, which is um, hybrid grading company. So a new grading company, very new, is actually grading cards with AI, with with, you know, computers, not human beings. I'm interested to see how that goes. We should talk about that. There's a whole visual element of the hobby. I think the data science would would have a big impact on. Heck yeah. Well, why don't I have you back on when we build the competitor? Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Again, this was awesome. And uh, looking forward to our next interaction. Sounds good.